Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson for Fairwinds. We have a slightly different format today because I'm out of the office preparing testimony as an expert witness in a nuclear safety case. In addition to the continuing releases from the Fukushima Daiichi triple meltdowns, our focus today is on a U.S. nuclear waste project in New Mexico that's contaminated workers and is leaking radioactivity into the surrounding environment. Located in Carlsbad, New Mexico, this Department of Energy, that's the DOE, Experimental Nuclear Waste Dump, is attempting to store leftover radioactive plutonium and americium from the U.S. weapons program. For those of you who follow nuclear waste storage issues, you'd know that americium has a radioactive half-life of several hundred years, while plutonium is radioactive for a quarter of a million years. Fairwinds Energy Education has received many questions about this serious nuclear safety failure. We have continuously been updating this issue on the Fairwinds Twitter feed, the Fairwinds Facebook page, and in press interviews. Common Dreams has also posted four separate and complete interviews with me on this calamity. And we've placed those links at the end of this video, on the page following the transcript, on our Facebook page, and on our Twitter feed. So what is this waste isolation pilot project called the WIP? Nuclear power and nuclear weapons both leave toxic remnants, in other words, toxic trash, that must be isolated for hundreds of thousands of years because this waste is highly toxic radioactive debris. It has to be locked away so it doesn't migrate into the air we breathe, the water we drink, or the food we eat. The nuclear weapons industry and the nuclear power industry claim that this toxic material is not a problem and it's safe to store in underground salt mines, which they hope are impervious to water and therefore will not allow this toxic nuclear debris to migrate. On the other hand, many state legislatures, city councils, intervener groups, landlords, and farms near the site, as well as environmental groups, worry that no site in the world can accommodate and store such toxic nuclear debris for a quarter of a million years. The Carlsbad, New Mexico Waste Isolation Storage Project is located in a salt mine that's a half a mile underground. The United States DOE calls this a pilot project because it's been receiving high-level nuclear waste for more than 10 years as part of this experimental waste system. This mine, just like any other mine, continuously removes the stale air inside and draws fresh air through a large system of huge fans that sit on the surface at the top of the mine, and it pulls the stale air out, allowing for fresh air to come back in. On the evening of Valentine's Day, something dangerous happened underground. DOE calls it an event, but in my book it's a euphemism, it's a slick word for a nuclear safety failure. It was a leak, it was a spill. Fairwinds has been quoted about this whip calamity and common dreams ever since February 17th. What do we know? Well, we certainly don't know enough because the DOE has not been honest with us and in typical U.S. government fashion, we're only getting small bits of the actual nuclear safety failure at the WIP. This is what DOE has told us so far. What? On the night of February 14th, radiation detectors in the ventilation system at WIP detected radiation in the exhaust air being released from the salt mine. That exhaust air contained plutonium and americium, two types of radiation that are extremely dangerous if they're inhaled, even in minuscule quantities. At first, DOE claimed no one was in the mine when the radiation was released and that their night shift personnel were in a separate building and therefore they weren't exposed to any radiation. DOE also claims that radiation filters were turned on within one minute of the radiation release so that those filters immediately began filtering the ventilation air 
being expelled from the nuclear waste storage salt mine. Now we've learned that land above ground at this dump site has been contaminated at least out in a half a mile circle. And we've also learned that radiation has been detected off-site as far away as in the surrounding communities. Last Thursday, February 27th, almost two weeks after these radioactive leaks and the nuclear safety failure, the Department of Energy announced that 13 workers who were on site on Valentine's Day when the roof inside the mine collapsed had tested positive for internal radiation exposure. The internal dose of radiation was detected in these workers' urine. More than two weeks after the toxic leak, the Department of Energy finally announced that all the WIP workers that came on site on February 15th would also be tested to see if they had been contaminated. There's more than 650 employees that work on the site in the day shift. Lastly, the Department of Energy claims that no personnel have been allowed to re-enter the mine since this severe radioactive leak was discovered. But what really happened at the WIP? Whistleblowers and family members of the mine workers claim that the ceiling in one portion of the mine collapsed, and that when the ceiling collapsed, it fell directly on top of canisters that are storing the highly radioactive nuclear debris. And that caused the canisters to rupture and to spew the radioactive contents throughout the mine and in a radioactive plume that moved off site. Based on the minimal data we've gotten from DOE so far, and it's couched in Nukespeak, it's Farron's opinion that, one, the Department of Energy has, hasn't told us nearly enough information, and independent scientists need more to assess the public health threats and the environmental contamination resulting from the radioactive debris erroneously discharged from the mine. Two, based on the fact that workers and land far outside the mine were contaminated, the underground portions of the mine are likely severely contaminated. Three, there are thousands of sealed canisters in that underground mine. At a minimum, one of the seals on one of those canisters failed, allowing the radiation to be released. But the mine roof has collapsed. And as claimed by people who are familiar with the site, it's possible that many canisters have failed in some other manner than just the seal at the top. And they've leaked toxic material that was intended to be secure for a quarter of a million years out the ventilation system. Such a major leak would leave extensive underground contamination and make that portion of the mine inaccessible due to high levels of radiation. Next, filters are not perfect, and radiation is continuing to be released even though the filters are operational. Department of Energy claims that its filters are 99.9% .9 effective. I don't believe that's true but let's take them at their word for the sake of a mathematical comparison. 99.9% .9 means that 999 minutes out of every 1,000 minutes, those filters capture every bit of radiation. But for one minute out of every 1,000 minutes, those filters capture nothing. Okay, let's do the math. A single day contains more than 1,400 minutes and WIP has now been venting radiation for almost three weeks. One minute out of every thousand minutes multiplied by three weeks means that the mine has essentially been unfiltered for 30 minutes once the nuclear safety failure began. While the surrounding communities were initially exposed to a one-minute burst of radiation at the beginning of this malfunction, now, there's at least 30 minutes of radioactive air that has escaped from the mine unfiltered. And finally, as the National Academy of Science determined in its Beer 7 report on the biological effects of ionizing radiation, all man-made radiation causes damage, and there's no level that's simply okay. So, we at Fairwinds have four major concerns. The first... 
How serious is this tragedy and how widespread is the radiation? A WIP press release offered to test anyone within 100 miles of the site for exposure to this man-made radiation. Can they mitigate the health effects too? Second, unless the workers were completely decontaminated and their clothes and shoes and personal belongings in their possession were destroyed when they got contaminated, some of the radioactivity went home with them and may have contaminated their families. Their families, their automobiles, their homes, their clothing, all should be tested, and they may need to be radioactively cleaned up. Did these workers stop at a grocery store on the way home or meet a friend for coffee? Were they wearing the same clothes home that they wore to work? These are not made-up concepts. The spread of radioactivity from nuclear workers and hospital workers or patients exposed to radioactivity who then bring that contamination home is a well-documented fact around the world. Third, what would happen if the roof collapse had not happened at night, but rather during the daytime when men were inside the mine? There would have been many physical casualties that would have been severely complicated by the high levels of radiation. The DOE was simply lucky that so far no one has died. Finally, nearby communities and environmental leaders have been concerned for years about water from fracking in the vicinity of the mine entering the salt and migrating into the mine. Is nearby fracking the cause of the roof collapse? We need to know the answers. We all need to keep the pressure on the Department of Energy to release more information. Right now, we all have lots of questions to keep asking federal authorities. I'm Arnie Gunnarsson, and I'll keep you informed.